sticker on here. Okay. Hi guys, welcome to Psychic Babes. I'm your host, Kirsten Sandifer. I am so excited today. We have Robert Lorry, who is an internationally known lawyer that focuses on commercial business, government, regulatory issues, plus charter and constitutional legacies surrounding cannabis and psychedelics and plant medicines. Um, as a lawyer in Canada, he works to reform laws and as a consultant, um, he advises regulatory government policy and um, offers solutions for companies that are, are operating in the psychedelic and cannabis industries. He's also a board advisor to MAPS Canada, The Last Prisoner Project, and he's a founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy in Sport Denver. His goal is to help uh, provide options for doctors and treatments for anxiety, depression, addiction, and PTSD, and he works tirelessly to improve um, patient access to these sacred plant medicines, psychedelics, and cannabis. And he's really one of these people who's out there doing this for us so that um, so these things can be legalized someday and that we're able to access these true amazing plant medicines. And they are medicines. So thank you for coming on the show. We're so happy to have you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Kirsten, for having me. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor. Well, no, thank you. I mean, you are one of those people that's actually out on the front lines doing the work behind all of this. So, I mean, it, you know, it, it really does take people like you to get to get past uh, some of these things. So thanks again. Um, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. So tell me a little bit about how you kind of got involved in this um, part of your legal journey and kind of your story. Sure. Well, I, uh, I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and Vancouver is notorious for um, counterculture and al al alternative ways of doing things. And uh, well, there, cannabis psychedelics have always been a part of these communities. I mean, it's quite interesting that uh, when you look at it, the, the, the history Greenpeace started in Vancouver, and I don't think had it not been for the Vietnam War, which again, you had draft dodgers from the US that again, a friend of mine, Rex Weiler, who co-founded Greenpeace, was chased all the way from Colorado to, to, to Washington State before he slipped over the border into Canada. And, you know, through safe houses, um, effectively, that's how Greenpeace started. So for me, growing up in, you know, this really great kind of melting pot that is the the west coast was exciting but it wasn't until i guess like high school that i first really got an interest in psychedelics and plant medicines which was through the saint george's summer reading list and on that list there were like brave new world by aldous huxley and the doors of perception um which that coupled with the cypress hill album black sunday with all the liner notes yeah. regarding hemp and the, the, the banning of, of industrial hemp, you know, that really piqued my mind as a young man, which is, this is wrong. Like how, you know, how can government and regulators sort of take this crazy stance? But on the other side of it too, my younger brother's best friend growing up was Seth Rogen's dealer for seven and a half years. <laughs> oh, no. So, right? Part of it was not wanting to have anything to do with this, but yet again, at public private school, you meet up and meet all sorts of characters from all sorts of backgrounds. So for me, that kind of planted a seed, which not only led to an interest in these met these medicines and like the, the 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 crazy reasons for why access has been denied, but law, law of questioning, you know these rules and these laws. And um, well, yeah, that led to law school and going to England after undergrad for Oxford where again, there was a very interesting drug culture in England at that time. And um, well, ending up being the, what they call city fodder, working in, in London in finance and law. Um, I worked a number of years doing, you know, cutting edge corporate finance work with big US and British law firms. And some of it was interesting, but a lot of it really bored me. But I had great experience sitting with the relationship partner to Imperial Tobacco that's what I ended up doing my six month litigation seat was learning all about product liability litigation from alcohol, tobacco to ballistic missile defense system. Wow. So in a way it was really 
interesting, you know, having this training and experience, but deciding to come home and coming back to Canada and having to requalify sort of said to myself, well, I'm going to take my career and I'm going to follow my passions and what interests me. And that coupled with dual qualifications as a lawyer in England and Canada and an Oxford law degree, plus the experience of growing up in the legacy market has enabled me to, I don't know, in a way, be like a perfect storm at this time and place as a lawyer. How did you step into um, working with uh, psychedelics and stuff and, and working with maps? How did that come about? Sure. Well, um, as mentioned, I requalified as a lawyer and while studying um, administrative law, I started to become familiar with the work of lawyers like John Conroy and Kirk Tucson and Paul Lewin, who are kind of like the OG original pot lawyers, of course, oh, and Alan Young as well. And that was, for, again, when with requalifying, thinking, do I want to just do corporate commercial finance work? And the answer was no. There's an element of charter constitutional litigation that, you know, being a conscientious Canadian and a political science undergrad just resonates with me. So started really looking at the cannabis charter litigation. And well, again, Vancouver being the city that it is had a dispensary problem five, six years ago. I mean, the number of illegal, unlicensed, unregulated dispensaries, as the government put it, it you know, increased Pro, the proliferation from like maybe 15 to 20 stores to well over 100. And based on that backdrop, that's when Trudeau was running for prime minister. So that coupled with a platform of legalizing cannabis, but yet living and practicing in a city when in 2015, in order to deal with this dispensary problem, the city of Vancouver decided to regulate dispensaries. So from a conflict of laws point of view, you have the federal law, which is clear, mm -hmm. to provincial law, which at that time there was no provincial legislation in, for you know, legalization for distribution and sales of cannabis, yet the city of Vancouver decided to regulate these um, based on what they said at the time was best practice from Washington State. I mean, we can get into more detail on this, but the long and the short is, I went to these lawyers and said, hey, I've been doing uh, administrative law and representing probably 40% of the Vancouver dispensaries. We should sue the city of Vancouver, the provincial government and the federal government. Okay. And that was about 67 dispensaries got together. And I represented about a third of them with two other, or two other lawyers. And then we had a team of lawyers and we practically ran at the government and this was yeah, a, a, a couple of years before legalization and the case was wow. decided about two or three months after legalization. So we thought that had we won, it, it would have completely changed the, le the, the, the legal framework. Mm -hmm. So out of that notoriety of you know standing up for medical access and patient rights, real hardcore activists started introducing me to people that were involved in regulatory work and um, legislative efforts in the psychedelic space. So basically, yeah, I was introduced to Mark Hayden, who's the former executive director of MAPS. And from there, that led to a lot of interesting work and assignments that, like FIRE, led to a number of other groups asking me to be an advisor and assist with uh, regulatory and legalization efforts, which um, have been interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about it because I, I know most of my audience is probably familiar with most of the benefits of these um, different medicines, but let's talk about maybe some of the non-known things and some of the maybe less, um, the lesser known, um, peyote and uh, things like that. Can we talk about some of the benefits of that and DMT and um, MDMA even, you know? Sure, well, again, I have to be careful as a lawyer. Um, nothing I say on this call, of course, is legal <laughs> advice. Maybe it's education, but I'd probably put it more in the entertainment category. <laughs> but uh, no, I've been very lucky with my, uh, with my career. And again, through an association with MAPS Canada, 
um, has been a, a, a wonderful foundation for which to really meet and connect with folks who are true pioneers and legends in the psychedelic space. And one of those people is Dennis McKenna. He's been a, a wonderful friend and a mentor for about the last three years. And I met him at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference at the University of British Columbia, where actually Dennis in the mid to early 80s had completed his PhD under um, Dr. Towers in um, effectively in the area of ethnobotany organic, organic chemistry. And that's how Dennis ended up meeting Wade Davis in those days, um, you know, was, was through that work. But Dennis uh, came up to me at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference and been known to do a pretty good Dennis impression. He's like, I hear you're a good lawyer. The people at MAP said I should talk to you. And that's how I met Dennis. We went for, you know, a quick or a 30 minute chat and he was telling me all about the McKenna Academy, which he first had been discussing with Joe Rogan on the Joe Rogan show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm like, wow, right? This is all some pretty groundbreaking stuff. And this was well before Johns Hopkins with the Tim Ferriss money decided to create a center. So ultimately, you know, Dennis can be said to be credited with one of the early, if you will, Renaissance Aleusian mystery schools. And for mm -hmm. me as a lawyer, I thought that was really exciting. So. I assisted with elements of, you know, they were looking at Canadian incorporations and then they eventually decided to go with the 501c3 route in the States. But rolling and hanging with Dennis has been pretty amazing. Uh, Imagine. You know, that was effectively my gateway to ayahuasca. So again, Dennis invited me. He says, well, if you're working with us, you're going to have to become familiar with these medicines and the customs and the cultures. And he says, the good news for you is, is we're doing a tour. And this was in January, 2019. So I signed up and that was incredible of spending three weeks in Peru with Dennis McKenna. And about one of those weeks was ayahuasca ceremony and the weeks leading up to it were preparing and dieta. Mm -hmm. So for me, these the benefits of these medicines, I mean, were pretty apparent and necessary at the end of that test case with the dispensaries i mean i was fighting that for like three years oh, yeah. and it ended in like december 2018 when we got the decision we lost but still i you know sometimes when you lose you actually win and just feeling so burnt out and shell-shocked and having devoted all this time and energy and realizing that my life was kind of out of balance you know, um, when I started that litigation, I was newly, well, my wife and I moved in, now wife, but we moved in together. Mm -hmm. And then like over those years, I got engaged, married. We had our first child, bought a house, had a second child, or a second child was on the way, all within the period of that litigation. So when all it all ended- All the most stressful things in your life, you you just kind of did them all at once, huh? Yeah. And the, the great thing is, is that I, I attribute and accredit these medicines to really helping me get back into a gr the, the right groove or the right place because you can get really angry and bitter and frustrated fr fighting and being a lawyer you know as cool as it is on one hand it's really stressful and the amount of substance abuse and mental health and addiction issues and uh Burno is so high in my profession that um, I really attribute work with these medicines with the right practitioners in legal jurisdictions um, to enabling me to bear witness, which ultimately is what drew me to working and aligning with Greenpeace is that the original Greenpeace founders effectively were based on it was based on the Quaker tradition of bearing witness. So how can you talk about the environment if you're not out there witnessing it? Yeah. And so for me, I, I looked at, you know, people like how Paul Watson would drive boats into Japanese <laughs> whaling ships. I love that. Love and that. I mean, I worked with a lawyer who represented Paul in that. But I looked at it in those instances and thought, well, as a lawyer, maybe I should be doing more of that running literally running into things and bearing <laughs> witness 
so that I can actually speak on this. And that's the thing that there's a lot of great folks out there in cannabis and psychedelics trying to promote a lot of good things. But I sometimes am dubious as to how much they actually know and how much of what they're promoting or preaching is is um, is is um, in the best for the medicine and, and the people's access to it. Well, I mean, it is an uphill battle with it because you're having to focus on re-educating people who have had this misunderstood interpretation of what these drugs or medicines, as they should be called, are. Because, I mean, I know when I was growing up, we had the D.A.R.E. campaign where they're, they're showing you videos of people smoking pot and jumping off 10-story buildings and committing suicide, which is just completely ludicrous and so far from you know what what the truth is it's like what what's really going on you know well, so. I, I, I can tell you a little bit i mean one of the just footnote here it's not funny it's kind of tragic but those poor monkeys that they did the original studies on or you know is smoking cannabis harmful well the results that into that study showed that those monkeys actually were asphyxiated because of oxygen pressure so, you know, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of false positives and misinformation out there. And let's just jump right into that. And, 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 and why did that happen? Well, the United States, of course, has had a rich tradition of prohibition. I mean, cannabis was prohibited back in the 20s, uh, along with opium. And uh, really, the United States got on board with this prohibition movement because of, funny enough, alcohol temperance and political initiatives of that in the 20s so really hemp and cannabis got you know thrown into that effectively as a line item but the interesting thing is nothing was said about psychedelic or psychotropic medicines until 1971 and that's impact impactful for the reason that the richard nixon administration is the first time in well, modern history, that psychedelics and psychotropic medicines were regarded by government or an establishment as antisocial. In fact, throughout history, and you'll appreciate this coming from a sh uh, shamanic traditions, in that um, that was the first time. I mean, throughout history, we have to remember that there's a rich history of psychedelics. I mean, you have to look at the Huico people in Mexico and uh, the Shipibo in the Amazon and the Bwiti in West Africa, Gabon with Iboga, Ibogaine, and even looking closer to home at our own First Nations indigenous groups. I mean, I grew up and I'm from the Pacific Northwest despite living in a few years in Texas, but even in, you know, Texas, you've got peyote and mushrooms and, and, and so on, which indigenous groups were, were using. So really looking at these histories and traditions, psychedelics were used as for food, social and ceremonial purposes. Well, even the Roman Catholic Church used to do, their censors used to have cannabis in them. And um, as purification, yeah. exactly. I mean, I, you, I guess you should consider having, and I'd love to introduce you. His name is Chris Bennett. He's known as the urban shaman, but he's one of the most, um, I get well, well, well researched scholars in the whole area of religion and cannabis. Oh, wow. And like Jesus, for example, what's really interesting is again, I can't quote it. I, this is why you need Chris, but you look at what Jesus was actually doing. He was taking cannabosm, which is the Hebrew name for cannabis, and nine pounds for nine ounces of uh, gold and oil. That, I mean, you know, Jesus was probably treating these demonic possessions were probably no more than Dravet syndrome, right? Severe epilepsy mm -hmm. um, and other conditions. And, you know, the other neat thing about Jesus is not to get off topic, but when, you know, talk to people like Chris, I mean, Jesus didn't necessarily die, right? And I mean, on the cross, he was resuscitated. And I mean, even the herbs that Joseph of Arimathea brought to the tomb, if we take any historical credit to the Bible, those herbs were resuscitation, right? They weren't for embalming or death. So, I mean, how many other people have died and resurrected? 
None. And then looking again at the three wise men, like gold, frankincense, and myrrh, like that, the frankincense and the myrrhs, I mean, there's hash in there somewhere, <laughs> yeah. right? And so to me, I look at it as these medicines were always here. They've always were part of our pharma, pharmacopoeia. I mean, P Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria, excuse me, was using cannabis tinctures for menstrual cramps. Everybody did, right? It was only up until the last hundred years. JC Penney yeah. even sold laudanum out of their catalog. Um, uh, you know, and it was in the twenties or something. You know, oh, so. Bayer had like the cocaine, cocaine mm -hmm. and opium cough drops and things like that. But the point is, is that these medicines surely were proven safe throughout history right. right what was it and i think a lot of it has to do with the big industry government mm -hmm. i mean the prohibition movement is quite interesting when you look at it back in like 1933 scientific america i believe it was scientific america had it was billion dollar crop was the cover of the cover and everyone was expecting hemp and natural products but the synthetics pharma big like big business big paper all of that lobby got together at differently to effectively sideline their biggest competition right if you're big pulp and paper you sure don't want hemp which you yeah. can replace and restore in a season where where i'm from british columbia old growth forest is just that it's several generations right um and then you look at where I used to see this, I mean, government and, and pharma doesn't want people who can produce their own medicine for pennies versus want being reliant on a- They don't want to heal anything because there's no money in healing anything. Well, to take two of these and call me in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, which suits the pharma industry just fine, doesn't really work when you apply that. So if we get back to your question about the effectiveness of these things, well, it's, you know, we're seeing Johns Hopkins finally getting NIDA funding to do studies on smoking cessation and alcohol and curbing other addictions. So, I, you know, I think that's going to you know, get more and more validation. But the problem for this is, is you're not going to need to engage in these medicines like you would for a take two and call me in the morning. And I think that is quite fearful and disruptive to a lot of these traditional revenue streams and then throw on top of that we're in the middle of an opioid uh, epidemic with the over prescription of these synthetic and opioids and other pharmaceuticals like ritalin and adderall and so on um through overuse and so something's got to give and i think that's where we're at an interesting time then especially with covid there's going to need to be actual solutions to deal with these problems once the Band-Aid is ripped off. Yeah. And the Band-Aid's not holding, Kirsten. That's, that's, I think, the impetus for a lot of this change. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I think the initial, you know, the reason, like we were talking about, that they tried to control all this was money, financial, but um, now it's kind of like the benefit, the costs of it are outweighing, you know, and, and even they're starting to realize we're going to have to utilize, bring these things back to utilize them because we've created such a big problem. Um, with well, I'll let you in on something interesting for your American listeners who may not have been aware of the fact that, well, we had an election last month. Justin Trudeau of the Liberal Party was reelected and about two, three days ago, we're, I mean, Canada is a, a parliamentary democracy. So parliament is made up of the executive and the legislative branch and cabinet. Justin Trudeau declared his new cabinet and that those are minister positions and a new cabinet position was created. And that is minister for addiction, mental health and addictions, which is separate from the minister of health, which traditionally is the minister for health Canada. And that's interesting because I've been involved with a, a or was involved, and there's many groups doing this now. But uh, yeah, Theracil was um, the first group in Canada last August, August 2020, 
to get the first Section 56 ministerial exemption for psilocybin. And uh, there hadn't been any of those issued since I believe 1974, right? So that started this process where medical patients who were, you know, dealing with uh, end of life PTSD and anxiety from, from, from cancer, end of life, effectively have been able to, therapists have been able to get exemptions to, of course, provide access to this medicine. And with the Section 56 exemption, therapists can access, they can transport, they can destroy, they can prepare, which I mean, they basically like grind it in honey and eat it or prepare that, but they can't produce. And that's different than in Canada with cannabis because the first Section 56 exemption for cannabis in Canada was 2001. And Terry Parker, who was a, or is an epileptic, I mean, uh, was growing his own cannabis for himself and others and was allowed to continue to produce his own cannabis. So I think that's interesting that, again, we have a minister, we have therapeutic access, but we don't have a safe regulated supply of psilocybin, whether that's EU, GMP, lab produced, or mushrooms uh, from you know a regulated supply, but that's all coming. And I think we're going to see in Canada in the next number of months, a few things happen. And that's going to be um, more regulation and access around therapeutic access. Great. And the legalization and regulation of a supply, but that's going to have a two tiered effect, which will be, and I call it the tale of two cities. I mean, it happened mm -hmm. with cannabis is anytime you legalize something, government and regulators on one hand are like, we've got to regulate this so strict and and usually big businesses involved and yeah, what normally would cost a couple hundred bucks or forty dollars in the black market ends up being several hundred to thousands of dollars being provided in a in a in a in a situation that well it's unlike anything i've ever experienced but the point is is that also with decriminalization and other points we'll get into it just means the black market i mean it never went away it's just getting more involved than will continue to be. So this is where regulators, you have to get this right, or they're just going to allow the black market to thrive. And just like cannabis, if it's too expensive, yeah, too hard to access, and there's all these other issues like quality, right? Mm -hmm. Then you know, they're, they're not going to deal with the black market. And that's always why they government tries to regulate these things is a, they want to make our streets safer. They want to protect our kids and government always sees it upon themselves to take the money out of the hands of criminals. Well, if they regulate them, then they're not criminals anymore. Right. And let's talk about one of your projects, the last, uh, I think it's the last uh, prisoner. Prisoner stand. project. Thank you. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. How many people are being put into jail for crimes with uh, psychedelics and things of that nature. The last prisoner focuses more on cannabis. And uh, I couldn't give you the exact numbers, but they're, 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 there's too many still in jail and going to jail for cannabis offenses. And what's this specific, uh, specific in particular to last prisoner project is, it is a not-for-profit that is dealing primarily with criminal justice reform mm -hmm. to address the issue that despite cannabis being legalized in many of these states and will to some form or another and within the next five years or a decade be legalized at the federal level that there's still people doing life for cannabis offenses and I mean that was wrong in the first place to put somebody in a cage for a plant which at the end of the day is proving to help people Right. certainly more so than anything that would be a you know that was being le with legal murderers. they're putting them in there with murderers and rapists i mean this, it families have been destroyed lives have been ruined and ultimately what i want to see from all of this is when is the government really going to apologize <laughs> right because you know at the end of the day great woohoo cannabis is legal but how do you make up for being like patently wrong yeah. 
for the last 97 years with this agenda that is just like something out of a horn all right what did the drug war prove and to me i look at it with mixed feelings because the government that's supposed to be the ones that are going to grant more access and make things better unfortunately are the the ones that have been the abuser and have victimized for so long that it's for someone like me it's hard to just say oh it's government they're going to do the right thing the reality is is government may want to most of the time they don't know how they're doing it and they don't have a clue so this is again where they end up or the need ends up being that folks will have to stand up and show them well how let's talk about that how can the average everyday citizen um help out with you know help help um, educate the government i guess if you will or help support this cause I think the way to look at these things is everyone has a role to play. You know, all these issues, right? You hear people speaking about misinformation or wrong information. I think it's important to, you know, again, without without doing it in a hostile or confrontational manner, challenging those views and beliefs. Because again, most people just go by what they've been told. Yeah. There really isn't much depth and exploration so again when you hear folks that are saying things again encourage them to get better acquainted yeah but Try then also realizing who are you as an as a person and what role do you want to play and there, there isn't really anything fixed and defined there i think this is it comes down to what does the individual want to do and how do they want to be involved and that can be as large or as minimal as 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 desired but again there's each state each province each country has groups and leaders that are already doing a lot of good work i mean the sad thing is the psychedelics are not new they're just new to you is what i tell most people right they never went away they just were put under lock and key by government and we'd probably be a lot further along with respect to oh, our absolutely. engagement but for the last 97 something years for cannabis and the last 48 or nine with respect to um with respect to psychedelics so again i think really getting behind different campaigns and groups and supporting but at the same token you know do your own thing because you'll also find that aligning with groups is good but sometimes the herd mentality might be different than what you know is right and necessary so i think it's important for the individuals great to point. be their own person step up in ways that are meaningful and impactful and you'll know if you're doing it right or not um <laughs> and but at the same point at the same time you know no person is an island these problems really? that we're facing if the cannabis experience has anything to say, there is no magic silver bullet and there is no one off win or like magic 10 count knockdown. The reality is, is this is a like little wars, right? It's a series of little wars, little events, little steps, little contributions. And that's just it. Don't be afraid to make a contribution because it's the little contributions that lead and add up to the bigger results. And so I think there's a time and a place for everybody to be involved because what, what's at stake is mental health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Do folks want to continue to live their life with blinders on and invisible shackles? Or do they want to see themselves in the world for how they really are? And I think that's really the fundamentals that you have to, the baseline that needs to be established before you can then build on that to continue to do good work. So really, there's a lot there of is no pot like of gold at the end of the rainbow. The rainbow is the fact that it, the, the, it is a journey. And really the pot of gold is with each step of the journey, you get stronger, more capable and more aware. And again, I think, you know, if folks want to achieve true freedom and personal sovereignty while well, psychedelics and being able to look inwards certainly help us with respect to our 
our standing and place within the outer or like the macro. So again, understanding that interaction between a micro and a macro in the individual and society at large is is a nice a nice basis to go forward and get involved. And then really that's the trick, get involved. Make a start and the rest will follow. Why do you think there's so much fear surrounding psychedelics? And is it just because the history, I mean, what we've been educated to believe? I think it's a handful of issues. I mean, look, we can talk about all the scare, the fear and the scare tactics and law enforcement and people's doors being kicked in and no knock warrants and police funding and all of that. But the reality is, is we have to look back at what we were doing prior to the prohibition. And I always like to put Canada on the map because Canada, Weyburn, Saskatchewan, um herbert humphreys and people like that were involved in studies that were dealing with smoking cessation and mental health applications um well before this in fact bill wilson who's credited at founding aa alcoholics anonymous mm -hmm. attributes an acid trip under you know supervision is part of i believe it was a clinical study at are the you time. serious wow like that's wow. what blew his mind with wow right and so to wow. me i think the greatest harm to these medicines is that these were part of our history and our birthright it was only in the last 90 years for cannabis and then since the 70s have these you know miraculous awe-inspiring compounds and substances i mean they've assisted humankind to millennia and so this is where again i caution where people get too hung up and well we have to grow cannabis at this medical grade and it's like well what were people doing throughout history they weren't growing cannabis in a box and you look at what were they doing in hoiko mexico the mazateca people right who have been using mushrooms probably since time of memoriam right same within the jungles of brazil ecuador and peru right or sacred and the sacred valleys right i mean these people managed to use these medicines without catastrophic results in fact quite the opposite so again that's where i differ with a lot of other lawyers and well, regulation lawyers, because they're all so quick to be regulated. Oh, we gotta be safe. We gotta be regulated. And we've got to forefoot another right in order to feel secure and feel safe. And well, for I like to call bullshit on a lot of that. Because if you look at the history and you look at the actual use, most psychedelics are non-toxic, are safe, and um, effectively again have been part of the, the the human lexicon for for thousands and thousands of years so to me what is wrong is that we've been sold a lot of information that has been done and designed for improper purposes and improper laws and technically as a lawyer that is where it you can i think it's a lot easier to take a stand and if you are representing groups that are doing things that are pushing the temple that are in fact illegal well in canada we have the canadian charter of, of rights and freedoms and one of the um charter items article 7 is the right to life liberty and security of the person so this is again where we've had like the anti-abortion right to die um history cannabis at medical uh, access um and you know a number of other other uh, precedent setting law which effectively the courts have said had to look and say well government you know in the case of if cannabis with terry parker they looked at it and said well mr parker should not be in a position where he's forced to choose between following the law and going without his medicine or producing his medicine and breaking the law therefore the government has to come up with a form of regulation and that was what became section 56 and then out of that the various cannabis legislation and so but I, at the end of the day i take it with well why do we need to 
fight this battle so hard when laws that clearly are wrong and are proving harmful need to be un undone. And that's just it. The difficulty in all of that, and I'll sum up on this point, is that we got to remember that Canada can do and say all at once. Even though we legalized cannabis and the first G7 country to do it, it's, what we're doing is still technically illegal under international law. And, and most of these international laws that came in, you know, with the UN convention, mm -hmm. especially with the 1971 and, uh, convention on psychotropic substances and the 1988 convention on trafficking, those were primarily led by the United States federal government. And so ultimately, this is where Americans, right? If you want to know what your role in all this is, we have to help you and you have to help us because ultimately we need your federal government to understand what it's doing at home federally and what's happening internationally needs to be modified and amended significantly because even on the books, these yeah. laws for psychedelics and cannabis, unless it's for medical purposes, or scientific research, any other access is illegal. And so those laws have to change. And then once those laws change, maybe out of that, we will have a thriving legal cannabis industry we can be proud of and access to the psychedelic medicines, whether it's through doctor prescribed access or therapeutic clinical access through treatment centers, right? Right everything's on the table i mean do you think there's also an element of there's something they don't want us to know like spiritually because i know the of course yeah the, they they don't want the everyday person really knowing what's what's be, what's beyond what they've tried to keep um take religion take the christian yeah. religion i won't pick a particular dominate uh, don you don't have to they're all yeah they're well, all guilty I, of it i went to catholic school i'm not catholic I but I, I went for i went basically for sports and uh well there you go but ultimately um what religion and what government for that matter yeah. would openly want you to engage in medicines or experiences that enable you to self-actualize and perhaps come to conclusions that run contrary and counter to religious doctrines such as divinity within right if we truly are created in the image of, of god created us in the image of himself then sometimes i mean that's why they're called entheogenic med medicines right connecting to the divinity or the divine within and that's where I do think it can get very dangerous when if you look at governments and religions that like now want to jump on and start conducting psychedelic mass, for example. I mean, no other group throughout history perhaps has done so much damage than organized Christianity when it comes to women's rights, indigenous rights, engagement with plant medicines, and a number of factors. So I think really you also have to consider the fact too that government has to be mindful of the fact that um you know people have they they have to somehow control the masses and i think when these medicines if the masses got their hands on them yeah it would prove difficult to control especially when it comes to just adopting narratives especially as we've seen over the last 19 months, it's like mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine. At the yeah. end of the day, what's being snuffed out is the dialogue. And ultimately, I think, again, more and more people really going if they on. engage with these medicines <laughs> may yeah. question the official, the official narrative. Mm -hmm. and, and again, just one other side footnote here, which is why I think internationally, it's gonna be very difficult to legalize and liberalize these medicines. I mean, under the law, I mean, people are going to do what people do. That's yeah. the nice thing about the black market. It's always there. But for trying to get legal traction and international law behind this, I think one of the biggest oversighted issues or, or, or unappreciated is the fact that effectively the, there's the United Nations General Assembly, but the enforcement and the real 
you know, meet is all decided in the Security Council. And the United States and Canada are currently, you know, I, I believe Canada is a member of the Security Council. The U.S., I believe, has life appointment, but so do China and Russia. And China and Russia, the only reason they agree to be part of the Security Council and play ball is they have life appointment and veto power. So when you look at how upset China gets with Falun Gong and Falun Dafa, which again is a spiritual movement that the people's government of China view effectively as homegrown terrorism Terrorism. as a threat to Mm -hmm. the state. So I look at it that if China's getting this wigged out about meditation and yoga, how are they going to feel about people now taking psychedelics, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I mean, look, it'll be interesting to watch it unfold. Um, well, I want to hear a little bit about like one of, tell me one of your most amazing stories that you have um, or journeys on any of these plant medicines that are in the Well, I could talk about ayahuasca because I was in Peru. Um, and now again, ayahuasca's <laughs> laws are that, well, these substances are legal under national patrimony. And again, like Peru, and other 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 countries, there are exemptions under international law. For example, I believe it's Article 32.4 of the 1972 Convention allows again, like groups, predominantly indigenous groups, who've been able to show a connection with this medicine, mm-hmm. are protected. So again, Peru has uh, different views on this, and I again was very lucky to go down there. So talk a little bit about it i did three ceremonies my second ceremony was pretty crazy um another little tidbit about me i was one of the youngest kids in north america that in 1980 i was diagnosed with adhd and i mean i take ritalin i've been you know like 40 milligram no 220 milligram yeah but but yeah a lot basically and the ayahuasca and the prep for it was one of the longest periods of where I was off my riddle in. Mm-hmm. And it was such a profound trip because I could just feel all this blackness, like tar coming out of my brain. And like, it was probably the closest to what I think a detox or withdrawal would be like, because I was just, again, like shivering and black coming out of every pore and I couldn't stop purging apparently from folks I know that that, that do this say that yeah I'm a, I could I could I could purge professionally I, I do it that well <laughs> but then immediately there were these visions of being on a rough river and once I met like I started to get my breathing and calm down and lie down right I started to sort of go from this black murkiness to where I, you know, I was on this boat, like a ship, kind of it felt like a barge ship. And the water was as black as what was coming out of me. And the water was rough. And I'm holding on to the rails, like for dear life, just vomiting and purging. And the waters are going up and down and I'm holding on for dear life. But it's, you know, I got my breathing and started to surrender and sort of take control of what I was feeling. And it was interesting because the waters, and now this is over the course of what felt like a few hours, the river and the water started to get calmer. Mm-hmm. And that black, gross, gunky, you know, cruddy water started to get clearer and clearer. And I sort of then found myself, I'd fallen asleep, but I felt like, the, but then when, with, with, with with the waking it was like almost like this rocky boat had lodged itself on the bank of this river that now was calm the waters were clear and the revelation i got all out out of all of that was self-control believe it or not right i one of those people that sometimes i taught first and when i should probably listen and you know shoot, shoot first before uh, before asking questions, um, but actually that's helped me get a better 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 grip of that because what it taught me and showed me was 
if you're on that black river and it's chaotic and your mind and your thinking is all over the place and somebody asks you a simple question like you, know, you probably struggle what is your name answering in those type of situations and but you the, the trick is you don't have to respond immediately right and that comes down to life that you can wait like you say something to me i don't like or do something or whatever i don't necessarily need to jump on that right away maybe i can sit with it i can reflect on it i love that and then i can respond and that showed me the value as a lawyer and as a you know as a, as a legal counsel and as a, as a father and a parent and a husband and all of that stuff that i don't just have to react because we're just conditioned to react and respond and you know again you can wait until your mind is calmer and clear like the waters that they should be but if you try to respond and do too many things when you're holding on for dear life puking over the side of the boat going up and down and your thinking is black what good are you going to be to anybody so what that showed me is is that you don't need to respond and that's always you will you need to get back eventually unless you want to ignore the person but that also showed me a good value in business Right, they always said old adage, don't take the first offer proposed, right? Never accept the first offer given. And again, you can present it an offer, right? Unless they've got a gun to your head, you don't need to respond right then. So again, there's this value in take time, create space, think about things and then respond. And yeah. yeah, for someone with ADHD who's hyper and has a very overstimulated, high functioning brain and curious mind, that is a skill. Because the last thing you want to do as a lawyer, counsel, advisor, parent, yeah. teacher, father, is just kick in doors and go through it without knowing what's on the other side. And in a way, that is kind of like conversation. If you just kick in the door without thinking, well, what's on the other side? what will my views my actions or my words how will they be reciprocated and viewed if you're not thinking that way you'll just be setting yourself up for rougher rides on that black rough river so let me ask you a question just because i came across this recently how um do we get around the education of our re-education of our youth and children um with we say no to drugs, but these, you know, these aren't drugs. Because my daughter recently heard me preparing for this interview and talking, Mom, what's psilocybin? And I was like, well, well give me a moment. <laughs> like you just said, like, well we'll, well, we'll talk about this after school. <laughs> and I had to take a moment to think, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to go about explaining this to her? Well, I look at it this way. You're the parent. We're parents, right? And at the end of the day, the buck stops with us how we wish to raise our children mm -hmm. and you know that it was a concern and it, 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 my wife I mean she's a nurse and I'm a for lack of a better word a counterculture drug lawyer with a <laughs> commercial <laughs> background and an Oxford law degree mm -hmm. but ultimately um, I want my children to be aware and understand things and well if I want them to understand me and the work I do they know I'm a lawyer and I've tried to explain it to my five-year-old that, well, sometimes people get into trouble. He knows what police are. He knows what doctors are and, and, and so on. So I try to explain people hire daddy because he understands the law and he helps, he helps interface with different people and conflict resolution. But I'm also a medical cannabis user myself. I have a 50 mm -hmm. gram, 50, sorry, 50 grams a day authorization to present possess i can grow 250 plants um there's there's an abundance of, of cannabis in my home but i store it properly and i i try not to use it around them if that makes sense but there are inevitable times where you know i'll have to pull out my vape pen but you know at the end of the day i'll explain to them that this is daddy's medicine right and that plants are used to make people feel better but we don't take medicine just like when we're out in the forest. We don't pick berries and we don't touch mushrooms, right? We can look. We, and really it's teaching them to wave to the flowers. It's sort of what we, I've told them, you know, yeah. wave to the flowers. 
develop a relationship. At the end of the day, I think if you fill them up with a bunch of stuff that's wrong, I mean, that's the double-edged sword with Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. <laughs> at what point, right, are you sort of setting up for, well, what else are you not being forth with about? And so I look at it, and I shared with this you earlier, like, it's so cool, Kirsten, that, you know, we practically grew up in, like, the same neighborhood, if you will, <laughs> in Houston right the Katy district and the way they went about things back then and i told you the first time i ever heard the word marijuana was from the houston police and the county sheriffs doing a dare presentation at addicts elementary in houston which is now maurice wolf elementary and this you know law enforcement said this drug called marijuana and they severe <laughs> adhd special needs kid in our class just lost it burst out laughing so for me, it just sounded like these exotic fear mongering terms, which mm -hmm. cannabis is the opposite. So for me, at least my children will grow up knowing that cannabis is a medicine that people use it for all sorts of things. And to be honest, there's already this crazy double standard with alcohol. Right. right? Yeah. Where, you know, no one has a problem with Johnny holding dad's beer bottle. Oh, isn't that cute? He's teething on the glass bottle. But a little whiskey on their teeth. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you mentioned cannabis mm -hmm. or a vape pen, even if it's not used, that, you know, it's such a double standard. And as I like to say, alcohol and can, no, what is it? Cannabis can save the world. But alcohol and tobacco, if used as directed, will kill you. I mean, that is the dichotomy. So I look, I really the aim is, and I think this is the best advice I can give any parent is, I want my children to grow up to be critical thinkers. Yeah. And unfortunately these topics are only gonna become more and more apparent and more and more exposure. But listen, when they legalized cannabis in Canada and they had legal dispensaries operating in Vancouver, I mean, the sky didn't fall. There hasn't been an increase in, you know, cannabis related road fatalities or any of that stuff. I mean, of course, can you I mean, OK, that's that's kind of a, a contradiction in and of itself, like cannabis road fatalities, because you see people driving stoned like they're very slow and careful. <laughs> it's not like. You know, so that's just, it's very funny that- Well, but again, like dealing with misconceptions. When I was in Australia, I was invited to be a speaker at Mardi Gras, or Mardi Gras as they call it. <laughs> yeah. In the first, first weekend in May. And this is like in Nimbin, which the best way to describe Nimbin, it's like if you were to take Tofino in Canada and Hawaii mm -hmm. and like Hobbiton from Lord of the Rings, that is like Nimbin. Wow. It's a crazy wow. place. And a crazy cool place. Um, but I got to meet this magistrate, which is like a judge in Australia. And, you know, he was one of the first magistrates to turn over a cannabis driving conviction for the very reason that just because you use cannabis and the presence of cannabis in the body does not prove intoxication. You see? And so that just because you use cannabis two or three days ago, and it might show up on a, on a and will show up on a blood test. It'll show up on a follicle to hair follicle test for up to seven or eight months if you're completely abstained. But that's the, the other thing that stays in your system. Whereas cocaine and a lot of these other more acceptable executive drugs are out of your system in like 72 hours, clear. So really, I think it's cannabis is the easy one. It's the poster child. Mm -hmm. for which police unions, law enforcement, and government regulators can point to it and say, we need more money, right? And unlike psilocybin and a lot of these other substances, you know, you just look at the last 40 years, how police unions have lobbied for more equipment, dog training, like all of these methods to spot and identify cannabis, right? where they're just going to have to figure all of this out now for psilocybin and all sorts of other drug production, which doesn't smell and give away the same carbon footprints like, you know, like, like cannabis does. Um, how do you think that, um, speaking about psilocybin, how do you think like the legalization for that or decriminalization is going to happen? Because there are, you know, certain, well, I guess they're, they're not in, 
there you actually there's no exemptions in the U.S. where you can um, get around the use of it. But uh, well, this uh, is where I think First Nations groups, Indigenous groups, like again, I live in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. and you got all like Paul Stamet says. There's when I spoke with him, and this is again a point for maybe your listeners that you know psilocybin is just one compound. When you look at psychedelic mushrooms, for oh. example, that contain psilocybin, there's over 6,000 varieties that also contain psilocin, which is also a controlled or you know, scheduled substance. So decriminalizing nature means that really these mushrooms that are found in nature is, I think, an interesting cornerstone because indigenous groups like you see with the Native American churches in like Texas and Arizona, they claim religious use to that. And I mean, more and more First Nations groups could be saying that, yeah, we were engaging with these medicines before contact, before Europeans showed up. Why? Because it grew everywhere. It's not like cannabis on the West Coast that came here predominantly because of draft dodgers in the 70s, right? You can really make that case. However, though, where, where we're, I think, going to see this play out, and this is the angle by which this work is all being spearheaded by maps, especially in the US, is it's the therapeutic model, right? And that if you can make these cases to the Food and Drug Administration that, you know, there's a need and breakthrough uh, status, and it's only a matter of time. But you see, accessing the medicines, fine, the government will grant access, and they should have. But what does that mean for legality? Right. Does that mean that then anywhere else I can source mushrooms or psilocybin is illegal if I don't follow the government program? So to me, it, you know, like decriminalize nature, you know, just looking at that as a as a as a concept that at the end of the day, government can regulate what they want. But there's a lot of plants out there that are harmful and toxic, like nightshade and a number of others that are legal and aren't regulated that will kill you. So to me, there's this disproportionate hype and regulation that again, it's not for our safety, but it's for these ulterior purposes and other agendas, which ultimately that is where everyone needs to step up and say, well, no, that doesn't, that's not right. What is right is looking at what we were doing before all of this prohibition. Because things like addiction which is and proven to be wrong. things like addiction and all the kind of crises that we're having with this depression being such a, at a, such a high scale, like they didn't have these problems back in, you know, indigenous times. Like they didn't, they didn't because they used these plant medicines to, to help them deal with things that were going on in the world. And there, you know, this this is a medicine. And I truly think that access to this medicine, we would be in a better place. I mean, you've seen the study done, uh, or you've probably heard about the study done on psilocybin, where um, with between uh, uh, couples, there were they were less likely to, male, men were less likely to harm uh, violently their partner if they have taken psilocybin. Like, it, it's just, it it's, evidence is very um, compelling. <laughs> I think the system is so broken yeah. that folks are going to look for what works. And if the government has an avenue for what works, then great, people will sign up and will engage in it. But the problem is, is that I'll give you an example, a really good friend of mine, I mean, their family are one of the largest cherry producers in the US. And they were trying all sorts for one of their sons who was having major, major addiction and mental health issues. And, you know, they were spending in some instances, 30 to $40,000 a month on like professional treatment centers, right. And, and detox and all of, all of the official tools and therapies that, you know, medical colleges are trained to, to recommend. None of it worked. Nope. None of it worked as well as a $40 bag of mushrooms, right? And that's before even utilizing like blindfolds and playlists and therapeutic conditions. And I mean, that was so eye-opening for that family. So at the end of the day, you know, with suicides, mental health and addiction, 
people need to get that help. And if, if, if they can't get that help in the legal market, then they will find it elsewhere. And that's the difficulty though, because not all the black market is good. Well, I yeah. mean, a lot of the black market, you know, the reality is there's a lot of good people doing a lot of good stuff that can't transition over for a number of reasons. And again, that's by design by the government. Yeah. However, um, you know, um, you know, the, effectively, you know, if you're hurting and you've got loved ones that are hurting and you've tried everything, sooner or later, someone's going to suggest something. And I think more and more people are going to say, look, I want to follow the law, but the law is so out of whack and that if I'm not healing myself now, then when? Right? I don't know when the law is going to be legal. So I think really it comes down to there's a right way and a wrong way. And the right way is that if you're doing something because of a medical health condition and you're able to point to it, and show what you've been doing and you're not harming anybody yeah. and you're not breaking other laws. I mean, break one law at a time, basically. <laughs> and I mean, that's where I remain faithful in that there will be groups like Therasil that have been lobbying the government because they want to see the rollout and things happen their way. And, but to me, I, I, you know, I think what also will happen is sooner or later, people are going to start getting arrested. And on the West Coast, where I'm from, the Vancouver police, they really don't care about them. And the RCMP aren't really trained in like mushroom detection. There's so many other things going on of greater consequence that the, <laughs> the chief of the Vancouver police has basically said, we're, we got bigger fish to fry. Like we got fentanyl and people dying and, and we an organized crime, right? And so that's where Vancouver, we're seeing about a dozen now pop-up stores that are full-on selling psilocybin right. and the city of vancouver isn't really doing anything about it right because they'll send inspectors but the inspectors are like oh they got they have business licenses and permits because they're getting like general retail permits or food food retail or uh, novelty retail licenses and wow. so the inspectors like walks their beat and goes oh hey uh got a, a new shop up here uh, any business licenses and they'll radio the mother she'll be like oh yeah yeah they got a business license mm -hmm. but nothing in that business license <laughs> right makes it legal to be like handing out um scheduled narcotics and that's where you know this whole decriminalization can get a little bit misleading because what decrim versus well legalization if something's decriminalized it basically means there's there aren't criminal sanctions attached to it mm -hmm. but in the case of cannabis it's actually more in many respects illegal now than it was before like there's more offenses and um and so on and and that really is going to be the difficulty because you've got prosecutors that are saying we need to free up our resources to go after the murderers and the rapists and we don't really care about like petty cannabis and mm. you know personal use psilocybin and psychedelics now that is again can be misleading because for individuals that's like okay well good i if i engage in these medicines and i'm you know for personal then i'll probably be okay but where do you draw the line like that probably that decrim it doesn't extend to providers, growers, cultivators, yeah. illegal retailers, online, pop-ups, whatever, right? And so the hammer will come down on folks that Somebody, are doing these yeah. things. But in Canada, we have, again, section seven of the chart. So really we're kind of in this gray zone where government wanna change, they don't know how, there's a few things on the horizon. But if you were to walk downtown Vancouver, you'd think this was legal. And again, that is because of these messages of decriminalization. Mm -hmm. And again, it's designed not to make these act, these medicines more accessible, Kirsten. It's designed to make the role of a prosecutor easier and to take the strain off of an already overburdened criminal justice system. Like, 
take you and I. You and I get caught with some mushrooms in our jacket, right? Um, well, the police are probably given we're first time offenders, right? Um, would be, and you know, I'm a lawyer and you're a professional. <laughs> Do yeah. they really are really are we really who they want to be ringing through the criminal justice system? The answer is no. Yeah. But if you and I were to open up a store or start trafficking and distributing and producing these on a scale, right? I, and on a fact pattern that demonstrates this is beyond our own personal use, mm -hmm. right? To get around possession for the purpose of distribution, then it may be different. So again, that, on the one hand, we're seeing some changes. But are these changes making it safer for people or not? And that's debatable. Gosh, yeah. What do you think is like, what do you see ultimately happening and what would you like to see? Like what's your optimal situation and what do you really think is gonna happen? Well, I'm lucky because given the work I do and who I do it for and how I do it and where I do it and all of that, there's no shortage of these opportunities and experiences for someone like me. Yeah. There's also for folks who know what they're doing. I mean, again, it's these aren't new. They're just new to these to the masses that, again, we're, weren't really paying much attention to this because of official narratives and legality. What will happen is sooner or later, the Food and Drug Administration and federal authorities in Canada and the United States and Western Europe, probably to start. Israel will be in there somewhere. There's just going to be too much evidence and too much reasons to, to not keep doing what has been done. I mean, there will be a lot of pushback, but what does this look like? And I think it's really early to tell. Ultimately, we will see some form of therapeutic access. I mean, if you've got drug addiction and treatment centers everywhere, you've already, I mean, you don't need to duplicate this. You just need to be able to offer these services and these treatments through the existing framework that's already right. there. Yeah. Um, I do think that, you know, money will be made. There's always money to be made, but that touches on, are the right people getting involved in these industries? And you got to look at like folks like Rick Doblin and MAPS. I mean, Rick's been doing this almost five decades, I mean, four decades, there's been action in, in the courts. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of hype. And a lot of people think that, well, just because cannabis was rolled out this way, um, psychedelics are next. And I mean, that's true to some extent. But I think there's also going to be a lot of disappointed folks that will either die on the vine, or will rot uh, will will rot waiting for the process, you know, with the licensing. And so there's an element of timing. So again, none of these things are really new, but will the way that companies, groups, or innovators present it, I mean, there has to be new ways and innovation, right? Yeah. And that's where I think the science will be interesting, but let's not forget that trying to do all of these innovations in, in a, again, in a drug, regulatory framework that is equivalent to yeah. a stacked deck, yeah. I think is futile. Yeah. And so to me, why would you want to play rules of a game where the rules are fixed? Yeah. To me, I'd rather see recognition that what we did for the last 90 years was wrong. What we did from the last since the 70s was completely asinine. Do over. <laughs> and, a, and a do over. But that probably won't happen because there's too many. Uh, the status quo is too invested. Too so many ultimately, out there. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I like to think that, well, we're going to have there'll be lots of avenues, some legal, some not so legal. But at the end of the day, is the system setting up citizens for failure? Or are we setting our citizens up to succeed? And I think, well, the drug war in the last 40 <laughs> years of this has demonstrated as long as with, and what we've seen, some of the revelations during COVID show us that either government don't know or they don't care. And I think it's a combination between the two. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I still think we're a number of years away till we have any kind of like recreational legalization. 
And to put things in perspective, it was 2001 that the first Section 56s for cannabis came about, that we have about this 15 to 18 year litany of litigation that went from like the early Section 56s to -hmm. the Cannabis Act. And, you know, we've only been kind of looking at our first exemptions since August. And there's a lot that has to happen, but I think we're in an interesting place. Yeah, I think a lot can happen right now, um, especially given the science, you know, um, and the studies um, for people like Paul Stamets and Rick that are doing such amazing work in this field. Um, you know, thankfully, I think we're going to either the public's going to speak up and we're all going to stand and unite together and kind of change things for the better. Or, like you said, you know, which I don't I don't think the latter will happen that the government will stand up and say, hey, we screwed up, um, you know. Let's oh, they won't. Work. They'll probably <laughs> just start doing way more funding of this work mm-hmm. in DARPA. You'll start finding these medicines will start making their way into the American military industrial complex beyond <laughs> treating veterans. Mm-hmm. I think there's, again, like there, there, there's two sides to this. I think we're truly at a nice way to sort of wrap up the conversation and in, in, or this topic is that uh, I was on a panel maybe yeah, two years ago and you had like Lars Wild from Compass Pathways and there's a Ronan Levy from Field Trip and you had, um, oh, the fellows, the original CEO from MindMed was there. Um, and then you had Matt, Dr. Matthew Johnson from Johns Hopkins on that panel. And then there's Dennis McKenna and at the far end was me. And it was really had this like nature on one side and like science clinical on the other. And I, I noted that observation and, and I said, well, what I think is going to come is basically already presented in, in, in terms of if we look at Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. In that book, you effectively had the genetic classification of science, like through your, your birth and everything was predetermined based on your genetic um your genetic positioning on one hand and then there was the noble what they called the the the, the, like the savage the noble savage the indigenous that's Mm -hmm. not the right term savage but however you had those two paradigms which i sort of see as the natural indigenous history (laughs) versus this ultra clinical modern scientific and well ultimately that's what huxley was talking about the brave new world isn't one or the other the brave new world is how do we reconcile those two extremes? And we're at just the beginning of that dialogue where we're just identifying what's happening on these two extremes, right? We're nowhere near understanding that and we're nowhere near close to reconciling any of that. So I think within the next 40 to 50 years of life that I've got on this planet, 30 so at least as a professional, that's what we'll be working toward is we're in the brave new world and there won't just be one way there will be the reconciliation of these two ways because ultimately environmental stewardship access to plant medicines and the protection uh, and recognition of indigenous rights they all are so hand in hand with these medicines that to only cover one perspective or aspect will lead to, will 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 we'll set up, will be set up for failure. Yeah. Well, if you have one message, um, I asked this of all my guests, like one message for humanity, what would it be? Your hope for humanity. Let me, let me process. That's a very important question. And with your followership, I want to get it right. Um, I think the important message that I have is that you have one life and what you do in this one life is, 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 is important. And I think it's important to go through life with your eyes wide open and these medicines can help with that for sure. But it also can help with an understanding of place within this world and role within it. And I think that's what my advice is, is before you can 
try to go off changing the world and fighting fights, there's a need to get anchored and centered in yourself. And that's what I would advise is to use the remaining time that you have to look at your life and figure out, you know, um, and you'll know by asking yourself, I mean, am I truly doing the best and as much as I can? And that really is, I think, to humanity is, are you doing enough? Because when it comes to these medicines, I, there's a lot being done, but I don't know if there's enough being done that presents these medicines for what they are, which is a disinherited birthright that we're now being, it's being sold back to us in a manner and in a, in a method that I don't necessarily see as being what's commensurate to ourselves. So yeah, being truthful and understanding that you really, you've got to be genuine and authentic and figuring out what that means, means better understanding yourself. So that's what I would say is that was, you know, if you want to kiss the sky to take a line from Bono, from you too, <laughs> if you want to kiss the sky, you better learn how to kneel. And I mean, ultimately the learning to kneel is the, the internal work mm -hmm. and the kissing the sky is the external outer work. So to be able to kiss the sky, you, if you want to kiss the sky, you better learn how to kneel. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And serve. I think a lot of people huh. get in to these medicines or like their profession or their their lives forgetting about service and so again i think a lot of it is what are you prepared and willing to serve and for me it's you know it's representing these these medicines these plants because ultimately they have a role to play with humanity and the spirit of the medicines itself and um, that needs right. to be authentic and that needs to be that needs to come through so listen thank you for all of the work that you do um on you know and this is this is such amazing stuff i love speaking with you over the last two hours i could continue to speak with you for probably four more but um I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to follow up and you know yeah. as things develop and look I think we're at an interesting point there's a lot up in the air yeah. but we're going to see you at least in Canada over the next uh, number of months and again with the creation of a minister for uh, mental health and addictions yeah, that kind of says something there it does say something um, yeah. but do I think it's going to let lead to some like free for all like we saw uh, in the early cannabis days in Denver and Colorado maybe but again even though we're seeing statewide initiatives like in Oregon right and that's exciting where you know the Oregon Health Authority in the next year and a half or so will be rolling out some form of access which again uh will what will that look like you know and how will that reconcile with international laws and federal laws and state laws i mean it's just honestly it is a can of worms that right. for me as a lawyer is so exciting and in fact <laughs> it's funny i i there when i'm when, when i was a young man my mom got me into John Grisham novels and mm -hmm. reading The Firm, which was made yeah. into the movie with Tom Cruise and Gene Hackman. I mean, a lot being a weed lawyer is a lot like a tax lawyer. <laughs> and in fact, there's this great scene in the movie where Gene Hackman and Tom Cruise are walking on a beach in Grand Cayman and yeah. Gene Hackman says to him, and then he says, you know what the best thing about being a tax lawyer is, kid? And Tom Cruise is, what's that? And he goes, Government changes the law. We advise our clients. Government changes the law. It's the circle of life, kid. And, and that's kind of what it is, is like, you know, we're living at a time where government changes our law. We advise our clients and then the government changes the law. Again. And that's really <laughs> kind of what I mentioned earlier is this is a, you know, it is a it is a game of many wins. And that's ultimately how we progress in this space is a series of little wins and with every little wins there's lots of losses but also those losses can sometimes be wins and I'll, I'll conclude on this note when we represented when i was in the dispensary test case representing all those illegal dispensaries and i mean it was stressful like thinking what was the law society what's the government you know i mean anyone breaking the law here like i mean i we were lawyers we were representing these folks and um 
you know, the, 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 the thought of all of this was, is that, um, you know, if we, if we, if we stand up and we are right, even if we lose, we can't be wrong. And the interesting thing is as well, the chief justice actually never decided the charter issue in our case. Despite us making all the arguments and going the distance, he reserved judgment for three months. And the reason is he didn't know what the hell to do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had Bruce Linton from Canopy show up to our last day of trial in court, which kind of I'm wondering that plus our other lead lawyer took a knee a month and a half before trial to go work for Canopy. So, you know, we're thinking that well, we're amazed we even went the distance in that. But yeah. the point I'm trying to make is sometimes when you lose, you really win. Because three years later, the city of Vancouver, Dr. Patricia Daly, who's the chief health officer, they're recognizing the failure of everything. And they're wanting to look at community methods of dispensing and accessing medicine. Well, I like to say, and I'm so proud and honored that, you know, to be part of representing the godfathers and the godmothers who were doing that kind of work for 20 something years before legalization. So again, um, stay with it and keep going and you'll be part of the change. And that's the beautiful thing when you can look back after a number of years and go, you know what? In a small way, I was part of all of those developments yeah. in one way or another, either through direct involvement or advising or in the courts. And I love that. It's actually given me much more purpose in my life and in my profession. So being a lawyer isn't all about money, but yes, the money, <laughs> the money does solve some problems. Yes, but um, I think we have you to thank for make, you know, making that impact that it isn't, you have to step forward for humanity for stewardship and the, the money and all that kind of stuff follows if you're doing the right thing. Again, I uh, was a young lawyer in London and uh, I worked for some big corporate firms. I mean, one of them was the CIA's law firm on Wall Street at one point. Sullivan and Cromwell, I mean, Google them. There's some interesting Wikipedia stuff about them. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I loved working for the, and I was very grateful. I'm very grateful and thankful for the people and the opportunities that I've had and the experiences that I've had. I mean, I joke that you could kind of sum up my uh, practice as being from Copperhead Road to Wall Street and back again. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I love that aspect of it, but I love the fact that I can be helping what I call 50 Shades of Green, which is <laughs> activists, members of society, medical patients, companies, entrepreneurs, government, law enforcement from time to time um so to me it's nice to feel valued but when i was a young lawyer at a at a supervisor who said you know the important i hated like the work i did I, it just I, I just knew it was part of a part of a process but he said something that really resonated which is don't follow the money have the money follow you yep. and well the money doesn't really follow you when you're starting out, right? On the, the path of being true to yourself and serving. It it comes again, and but again, when you're in alignment or in truer alignment with who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do, things just get a lot easier than fighting against the stream and fighting against the uh, you know the forces that be. So I think life doesn't you know, have to be like that. To Life doesn't have to be so difficult, you know, no. <laughs> it really doesn't. But the other thing too is, is like, I think there's a lot to be said about finding your own experiences and your own authenticity in that, because whatever is decided at the end of the day is hardly going to be solely what Rob Lorre, <laughs> right? Or anyone else for that matter devises. And for me, why I like what I do or part of it is I get to do these medicines with skilled practitioners in an environment that are more likely what's been done throughout history. So there's the tribal, there's the spiritual, there's those feelings of rites of passage, which I don't know how much of those traditions and, you know, the sacred, keep, you know, keep keeping 
of the fire, the, you know, the fire keeper traditions, you're going to see in like a lot of these modern clinics and many, in many respects, they're doing good work and I don't want to diminish, but I sort of see it almost as a bastardization, like taking a hair and nail spa and combining it with something sacred. And I, um, you know, I, I, for me, what's important is again, getting the authentic experiences and working with the authentic leaders. And I want to be a voice for that because that's what we have the biggest fear of losing are these plant medicines, are these indigenous traditions and are these ways of life that, you know, once they're gone, they're gone. And, you know, let's not forget that Western medicine is based on um, number of uh, a number of other civilizations medicines like Ayurvedic medicine and you only have to look at the Vedas to see that none of this is new right and so that's why I get frustrated at least in the case of cannabis when you hear government and regular oh well, we, we just need more studies it's like this is the most studied plant in the history <laughs> of plants what what I think is more study is fine. You can always have more study, but it needs to be study applied in the right place against the correct regulatory framework. And if we can agree and conclude on the basis that the last since 1971, right, and drug war prohibition, if that has been wrong, then where do we go from there? Well, that's been acknowledgement that was wrong so that we're not continuing that tradition going forward. And to do so, I think, is only going to end up causing more problems than it will solve. So again, I remain cautiously optimistic, but as a lawyer, I have to, rep, rep, I have to <laughs> advise everybody, caveat emptor, which is Latin for buyer beware. None of this is regulated, and um, it's taken me a lifetime to swim in these waters and not be bothered by the sharks. But I think there's a lot of folks out there that you dip your toe or jump in, dip it not. the sharks are going to go right for you. And that's the thing to be important, to be mindful of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things out there. Yeah. And if you're not sure, you talk to somebody or raise it with folks who know what they're doing. And look, I'll extend to you and your listenership. There's folks out there that want to connect with you who want to connect with me. I'm happy to do that because, you know, five few minutes of five, 10 minutes of some advice might save somebody's life. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this. It's been a pleasure having you on. An absolute pleasure being your guest. And I think it's so cool that you reached out and uh, yeah, consider me a friend to your um, to your uh, production and hope to be a, a guest again soon. This is a wonderful experience. And Absolutely. I'm so impressed with the work that you do and the insightfulness by which you um, conduct yourself and engage with these medicines. And uh, yeah, we need more we need more folks like yourself who come to this work with the clarity and the intention that you do. So Thank you. From, Thank you. from me to you, congratulations. And um, I look forward to following your work and, um, and uh, collaborating. Thank you.